On May the 26th, 1828, a strange unknown teenage boy appeared for the first time on the streets of Nuremberg, Germany. He was wearing pantaloons, a silk necktie, a waistcoat, a grey jacket and a handkerchief with the initials KH embroidered onto them. His boots were so mangled and torn that his feet were actually bursting through them. All he had with him was a letter addressed to Captain von Wessenig, the 4th Quadrant of the 6th Cavalry Regiment. It claimed to have been from somewhere in the Bavarian border, though the specific location wasn't disclosed. I send to you a boy who might, as he wishes, serve faithfully the king. The boy was left with me, 1812, the 7th of October, and I am a poor day labourer with ten children and have enough to do to take care of them and his mother left the child with me to bring him up, but I have not been able to speak to her and I did not mention to the justice that the child was left with me. I thought that I must consider him as a son and have brought him up like a Christian, and have not since 1812 let him go a step from the house in order that nobody might know where he was brought up, and he himself does not know how my house is called, nor what the place is called. You may ask him, but he cannot mention it. I have already taught him to read and write. He can write my handwriting like myself and when we ask him what he will become, he says he will be a light horseman as his father was. If he had parents, which he has not, he would have been a learned lad. You need only shoe him anything, he can do it at once. I have brought him only as far as Neumark, from thence he must go to you. I have said to him that when he is once a soldier, I will come immediately and visit him, otherwise it would cost me my neck. Best of captains, you need not trouble him at all. He does not know the place where I am. I brought him away during the night. He does not know the way home. I am your obedient. I do not make my name known as I could be punished. And he has not a farthing of money with him because I have none myself. If you do not keep him, you may kill him or hang him up in the chimney. He also carried a second, much shorter letter on a scrap piece of paper. This being the supposed note the author of the first letter received when he was first handed the boy as a baby 16 years earlier. The child is already christened, is called Casper. You must yourself give him a surname and bring him up. His father was a light horseman. When he is 17 years old, send him to Nuremberg, to the 6th Regiment of Light Horse, in which his father also served. I beg you to bring him up till 17 years old. He was born on the 30th of April, 1812. I am a poor girl. I cannot support the child. His father is dead. Weirdly, the handwriting was almost completely identical to the other letter, leading many to believe that Casper himself had actually written both. The only words the teenager would repeat over and over were, I want to be a cavalryman as my father was, as well as horse, horse, almost as if he was repeating these words from memory. He was taken to the home of the captain, but any questions were met with a don't know response, or take me home, or even complete silence. He was in a distant and delirious state, almost in a trance. They believed that he wasn't an idiot or a crazy person, but he did possess the actions of a child, walking as if who was a toddler only just learning how, though there are conflicting reports where others claim he was able to walk perfectly fine. Weirdly, despite the poor conditions of his boots, his feet weren't particularly damaged and were described as being as soft as the palm of a hand, as if he had never even worn shoes before, though other reports claim that his feet were covered in blisters. He was then taken to a police station and despite being unable to answer many questions, he was able to write, which is when he called himself Casper Hauser. Though it's believed that this was a fake name, considering Casper was supposedly isolated since birth and wasn't allowed outdoors, hence the name Hauser, which is German for houses, and it's the definition of a person who gives shelter or protection to someone. He was able to read a little, could recite prayers, and was also familiar with money, but his vocabulary was very clearly limited. He was once brought a lighted candle and seemed amazed at the flame, even going to grab it before burning himself. A similar incident showed him becoming fascinated with his own reflection in a mirror, though he would quickly turn around to see who the person was. Casper often acted like he had never seen these things before, or even the outside world. He would grow greatly distressed even upon seeing an inside being crushed to death. 
He wasn't able to tell them where he came from and according to one report, when a police officer threatened to abandon him in the woods if he didn't comply, Casper broke into hysterics and cried like a child begging, not the forest, not the forest. However, he had no evidence of his identity, so he was actually locked away as a prisoner. For two months, Casper was locked in Lugansland Tower in Nuremberg Castle. Despite his alleged difficulty walking, he was otherwise healthy. Over time, his mobility improved and he was able to walk over 90 steps up to his room. His face had healthy complexion and was in overall good condition, but he seemed to have limited intelligence, though he did have excellent memory and was an extremely fast learner. He would also gain enthusiasm and excitement whenever people would visit him, though he would refuse any food that wasn't bread and would only drink water. If he did attempt any other food, it would result in vomiting. They even attempted to hide other food inside the bread, but Casper would suffer negative reactions to them, such as more vomiting, headaches, or even diarrhea. His jailer had an 11-year-old son who would befriend Casper and taught him to speak German, which he picked up relatively quickly, though he would speak in an indistinguishable foreign accent. It was originally believed that the boy must have been raised as an animal in the forest, but after time, Casper was able to retell stories of his past life, even later writing them down. He claimed that his entire memory began with him living completely alone in a dark cell, only about two meters long and one meter wide, and only one and a half high, with a straw bed to sleep on, a bucket to urinate or defecate in, and his only toys were two horses and a dog carved out of wood. Casper claimed that he would find bread and water next to his bed each morning, but he never saw who put them there. Over time, the water would taste a lot more bitter, causing him to sleep a lot more heavily than he normally would. He would then awaken to find his bed had been changed and his hair and nails were cut. The first time he ever encountered another human being was when he was visited by a mysterious man a short while before he was released. And even then, the man protected his identity, covering his face as much as he could. Casper claimed he taught him to write down his name, taught him to stand and walk, and then brought him to Nuremberg. He also taught him to say the words, I want to be a cavalryman as my father was. But Casper didn't even understand what these words meant. He also claimed that during the journey to Nuremberg, he was forced to only look down at the ground. He was then simply handed the letters and then completely abandoned. This story gained huge attention across Europe and Casper Hauser was discussed worldwide. Presumably, because of his time in the cell, Casper had exceptional eyesight, being able to read in complete darkness, being able to spot and identify entire constellations in the sky, and he was even able to hear what was being said from across the room, even if it was whispered. He was able to read house numbers from a distance in the dead of night, which he was unable to do during the day, and indoors during nighttime was even able to point out a gnat that was on a spider web all the way across the other side of the room room. However, in contrast, due to his years of isolation, Casper would convulse if he was exposed to loud noises, bright light would cause him to howl in pain, the smell of coffee or alcohol would make him vomit, and he even once became drunk just from the smell of wine. He was even able to identify people in complete darkness simply by their smell alone. Over time, Casper did develop a larger vocabulary, but it was believed that he wasn't necessarily learning new words, but more remembering them from an age where he may have previously forgotten, possibly around the age of three. The boy did speak of a very specific dream of his where he would appear in an enormous castle with an elaborately dressed woman and a man dressed in all black carrying a sword. It's believed that this could have been a faint memory of his early life, maybe even before being held in captivity. Casper did become adopted by the town and money was given to educate and raise him. Schoolmaster and philosopher Friedrich Daumer took care of him and taught him to draw, which became a huge passion and talent of his. During this time, Daumer also subjected Casper to homeopathic treatments and magnetic experiments. Casper claimed to endure intense pain during thunderstorms due to the static electricity, and he was strangely able to identify metals that were hidden under a cloth just by feeling them, based on how they would pull at his fingertips. 
On October the 17th, 1829, Casper didn't show up to the regular midday meal, but was instead found in Dalmer's cellar, bleeding from a cut forehead. He claimed that he was sitting on the privy when he was attacked by a hooded man who sneered, You still have to die ere you leave the city of Nuremberg. Casper claimed that he recognised the voice and that it was the same man who had brought him there. He claimed that he was dressed in all black and attempted to slash his throat, but he ducked and his forehead was cut instead. Officials were alerted and it was now believed that he possibly came from Hungary or England, though others believe he cut himself with the razor. After he was attacked, he fled to his room but didn't alert any of the caretakers. He then ran and climbed through a trap door to escape into the cellar. Some believe that he cut himself and only returned to his room to hide the razor or put it back in its rightful place. Furthermore, Dalma and him had previous arguments where he believed the boy had a strong tendency to lie. On April the 3rd, 1830, a gun was heard going off in Casper's room. His escort quickly rushed in and found him on the floor, bleeding from a wound to the right side of his head. Once waking up, he claimed that he climbed upon a chair to get some books, but the chair fell. He tried to grab hold of something to steady himself, but he accidentally tore down a pistol that was hanging on a wall, unintentionally setting it off. This story was also doubted, people believing he was only pulling these stunts for sympathy, but due to these incidents he was relocated to the home of Baron von Tucher, who would also later complain about Caspar's vanity and constant lying. And his wife also despised him, claiming he would make up lies just to be spiteful. It wasn't until late 1831 when British nobleman Lord Stanhope started to take interest in Caspar Hauser. He even spent a bunch of his own money to try to find his origin, even taking him to Hungary to hopefully jog his memory. Caspar did start to remember certain Hungarian words and even claimed that the Hungarian Countess Matheny was his mother, but he didn't recognise any buildings or monuments in the country. And this was when Stanhope began to doubt his story. In December that year, he transferred him to Ansbach, where schoolmaster Johann George Meyer ended up caring for him, and in January, Stanhope completely abandoned him for good. He did continue to pay for his living expenses, but he wouldn't visit him anymore, and refused to take him to England like he had promised him previously. Johann Meyer, much like many others, also wasn't a fan of Caspar, hating his excuses and lies. By late 1832, Casper got a job as a copyist in a law office. He still had hopes that Stanhope was going to take him to England, but he was unhappy with his living situation, which only grew worse when his patron, Anselm von Feuerbach, passed away in May of 1833. This loss was a huge blow to him. However, allegedly, even Feuerbach himself started to doubt Casper's credibility. A note from him was discovered after his death. Kaspar Hauser is a smart, scheming codger, a rogue, a good-for-nothing that ought to be killed. But it's unknown whether he informed Kaspar of his true opinion or not before he died. On December the 9th, 1833, Kaspar had a huge argument with Mayer. Lord Stanhope was expected for Christmas, but Mayer didn't want it to happen. Just five days later, on December the 14th, Casper returned home with a deep wound in his chest. He claimed that he was lured to the Ansbach Court Garden where a stranger tried to give him a bag before violently stabbing him. Naturally, his story was initially doubted. Hauser tried to lead people back to the area where he was attacked, but he collapsed midway. Upon searching the garden, a small violet purse was discovered, including a note, handwritten in pencil, but Weirdly, it was written backwards, as if whilst looking into a mirror. Hauser will be able to tell you quite precisely how I look and from where I am. To save Hauser the effort, I want to tell you myself from where I come. I come from the Bavarian border, on the river. I will even tell you the name, MLO. The identity of these initials have never been discovered. Kaspar Hauser would pass away from his injuries three days later at the age of just 21. However, due to his constant lies and inconsistencies, many believe he actually stabbed himself and made up the entire attack. 
The note in the purse had spelling and grammatical errors that were typical mistakes he would make. On his deathbed, he was muttering gibberish about writing with a pencil, though his dying words were reportedly, I didn't do it myself. He was also adamant that the purse needed to be found, but never once asked for what was inside. The note was folded in a very particular way, in a triangular shape, which is exactly the same way he would fold his own letters. Furthermore, it was snowing that day, but the only footprints found at the scene of the crime were Casper Hauser's. And forensic doctors concluded that the stab wound could have actually been self-inflicted. It's believed that he stabbed himself to try to revive public interest in him and his story again, or to garner more sympathy from Stanhope and convince him to take him to England as promised, and he may have accidentally just pierced his chest a lot more deeply than he had intended. Kasper Hauser was buried in the Stadtfriedhof Cemetery in Ansbach. After his death, Lord Stanhope felt like it was now his duty to openly confess that he had been deceived by the boy and that all of his stories weren't true, publishing a book presenting all of the evidence against him. Some felt like he was using Casper's death for his own gain, but historians conclude that he was a genuine man simply seeking some answers. To this day, Casper Hauser's story of his upbringing has been widely disputed. If he had been living since childhood under the conditions he describes, he would not have developed beyond the condition of an idiot. Indeed, he would not have remained alive very long. His tale is so full of absurdities that it is astonishing that it was ever believed and is even today still believed by many people. During the autopsy, Casper's brain was examined and it was of small cortical size and it was believed he suffered from cortical atrophy or possibly epilepsy, which would explain his convulsions at bright lights. Though other experts claim there were no abnormalities in his brain whatsoever. Others believe he was just an extremely paranoid person and therefore was able to play this fake character so perfectly. He was always extremely hysterical, but most believe he was just a pathological liar and a complete con man, desperate for fortune, fame and attention. In 1928, a study was conducted and it supported the fact that Casper stabbed himself and accidentally committed suicide. Though in 2005, a forensic analysis said otherwise, claiming that it was unlikely that it was self-inflicted, but it can't be conclusively discarded as a theory. But Kasper Hauser's death is only one part of this mystery that remains unsolved. Who was Kasper Hauser? There is absolutely no historical evidence of Kasper Hauser ever existing before the age of 16. There are no records of who he could have been before he was discovered in Nuremberg. Some claim that he came from royalty and was actually a prince, while the majority of people believe he was just a lying faker. It's believed that he could have been the hereditary prince of Baden, born on September the 29th, 1812. However, this prince died just weeks later on October the 16th. It's believed that he was switched with a dying baby in order to make way for the next successor, and that original prince was Caspar Hauser. This means that Caspar's parents would have been Charles, Grand Duke of Baden, and Stephanie de Bohanet who was the cousin and adopted daughter of Napoleon. Furthermore, over the years, Caspar did grow to supposedly bear a strong physical resemblance to the Grand Duke. It was even believed that he was deliberately taken away and held in captivity to prevent him from finding out the truth and returning to his royal roots. The aforementioned Fauerbach allegedly claimed to have evidence to prove that Caspar was the prince, but his death was under mysterious circumstances and certainly untimely, just days after making this announcement, which of course led to much speculation. Though this theory completely contradicts the note that Fauerbach left behind after his death, calling Caspar a liar. 
It wasn't until 1876 when this theory was followed further, using the prince's official documents, baptism, autopsy and burial. The Grand Duchess wasn't allowed to see her baby after he had died as she was too ill, but the baby's extended family were allowed and they would have noticed a different child. But nothing definitive was proven. It wasn't until November of 1996 when there was an attempt to create a blood sample from underwear that's believed to have actually belonged to Caspar Hauser, comparing it to the descendants of the prince's family. And it proved that Caspar Hauser was not the prince. In 2002, further analysis began on hair and body cells from clothing that belonged to him, but these DNA samples didn't match the blood from the underwear, now casting doubt on the 1996 experiment. These new samples were again compared to the descendants of the prince, and although they didn't match 100%, they were close, and they didn't differ enough for the theory to be completely ruled out. The differing DNA could have been caused by a mutation, especially considering the mitochondrial DNA only passes through the female bloodline, which can't change except through mutation, and this DNA test was done on a female descendant. There are no medical examinations allowed on the prince or his mother, so this theory will forever remain a complete mystery. It all started with an innocent mystery boy on the streets of Germany, and it led to nearly 200 years of speculation. Was this boy really held captive and then targeted and murdered, or was it just an intelligent man trying to desperately gain infamy? We may never know where he came from or how he died, but Caspar Hauser continues to fascinate the world and is arguably the biggest unsolved mystery of the 19th century. And after nearly 200 years, we are still seeking answers.